buy you a free dessert. Oh my goodness, that's a lot. I don't, I don't think I've seen seminars down here with a hundred. Yeah. Okay, I think, I think uh, we can get started. Um, so uh, today I have the privilege and honor to introduce uh, Dr. Andy C., a distinguished professor in the Department of Environmental Science and Policy at the University of California at Davis, uh, as an invited speaker in the Ecology, Evolution, and Conservation Biology Seminar Series that's hosted by the Departments of Fish and Wildlife, Forest Ecosystems and Society, Integrative Biology, Botany and Plant Pathology, the OSU Research Office, and the Forest Biodiversity <laughs> Research Network. Uh, hailing from Queens, uh, New York, Dr. C received his bachelor's at the State University of New York at Stony Brook and his PhD from the University of California at Santa Barbara. A foundational figure in animal behavior, Dr. C has been awarded multiple honors from the Animal Behavior Society, including the Quest Award and the Exemplar Award, even serving as the president. Dr. C was recognized as an ISI highly cited researcher, recognized in 2019 by being in the top 1% of citations in a particular field over a 10 year period. He has amassed almost 40,000 citations, um, almost 15,000 in the last five years alone. In addition to being a foundational researcher in his field, Dr. C is also an accomplished musician and dancer and hoster of dessert parties. <laughs> Dr. C's contributions to science extend beyond his research, also to being a mentor and advisor to former students who have gone on to be accomplished scientists in their own right, including my PhD advisor here at OSU, Dr. Tiffany Garcia. I am proud to introduce Dr. C for his talk, Ecological and Social Implications of Behavioral Syndromes. <laughs> okay, uh, I guess I'll ask, everybody can hear me just fine. You know, maybe I can see Jeremy, looks good. Okay, and uh, yeah, I'm happy to be introduced as somebody who loves to sing and dance and stuff, but uh, I'm gonna tell you today, not in the form of song or dance uh, about sort of a current work in a field that I've been identified with over the last uh, uh, maybe dozen years or so, of animal personalities, sometimes referred to as behavioral syndromes. <clears throat> and I'd like to start the talk with this uh, slide. And this is a picture of a, actually a reunion of my lab group in, or members of my lab group in 2005. And I'm uh, pleased to say that actually at this point, most of them had finished their PhD and that at this point, uh, they're pretty much all uh, professors, you know, tenured faculty members at uh, good research universities. Uh, so I'm proud of that. But the main point of showing this slide is the fact that these people have different personalities. And uh, I won't get into any stories, but Lauren and Tiffany are distinctively different personalities. And we're all sort of used to that, that different people have different reasonably consistent ways in which they do things. And we sort of rely on that as, as part of our lives. And I think we're pretty comfortable with the notion that different dog individuals have different personalities and different cats have different personalities. <clears throat> but over the last dozen years or so, there's been a growing recognition that almost any animal you look at, there are consistent individual differences in their behaviors. <clears throat> and these are just an assortment of some of the animals that have actually gotten a lot of attention for their quote unquote personalities. So what I'm gonna talk about today is first the general introduction to the concept, just to get you on board. And then four areas here uh, sort of social ecology and three elements of ecological implications of things we're doing in the lab right now on uh, how personalities work and why they matter. Okay, so when we ask what is this animal personality phenomenon, I'm going to describe it in just in sort of terms of how we even measure it, which is often what we're doing is testing single isolated individuals one at a time repeatedly in standardized assays and like a simple assay is to even just uh, put an animal in an arena and see what it does, where some individuals will be uh, sort of much more active in exploring the arena and others actually will cower in a corner. And when we do that repeatedly with each individual, we find that often they're fairly consistent in what they do. And there are various different kinds of standardized assays. And when we do that, we find, of course, individuals are 
you know, exhibit plasticity, that what they do depends on what situation you put them in, but they often have a consistent behavioral type or personality. And I'm going to abbreviate it as BT for uh, behavioral type. And so some are more bold, others more shy or more cautious, and that it's uh, often a normally distributed range of, of personality. And some are aggressive, others less aggressive, again, the full range, and so on. And that uh, statistically, what we're saying is individuals have some within individual behavioral consistency, a behavioral type, but there are consistent differences between individuals and that we see this over and over. And over the years, uh, we found that also uh, individuals often have uh, behavioral syndromes, which are correlated behaviors across the context. So it might be something like individuals differ in their aggressiveness and that the more aggressive males beat up other males and get a good territory. Uh, but we find those same males are more aggressive than others in a feeding context. And even though there's you know, nobody else around, just food, they have a higher feeding rate than others. And they tend to be in some cases more aggressive than maybe they even ought to be in a mating context. And those same aggressive males engage in sexual coercion. Uh, or we find that sometimes these more aggressive males actually just can't seem to calm down and be good parents. And quite often we get data suggesting that more aggressive individuals are also bolder, even when danger is around. And not to say they will die, but they have a higher likelihood uh, that they'll get killed. So having a behavioral type that includes being, say, more bold and more aggressive, I do mean to say often has good elements to it but also bad elements. So there often is this interesting trade-off from having a given uh, personality. So over the years, uh, we found that uh, there are hundreds of studies now finding this behavioral consistency phenomenon, and that we know quite a bit about the neuroendocrine correlates, the heritability, and even molecular genetic uh, underpinnings. Uh, it does affect fitness in ways that depend on the environmental context, sometimes showing suboptimal behavior. Uh, we find that populations and species differ both in their average behavioral type and in their pattern of behavioral correlations. And we find that early experiences matter in ways that depend and are sort of interesting. Uh, and that actually the stability of it is not necessarily, is typically not forever and there's variation in how stable the phenomenon is. Okay, so that's my simple uh, introduction to it. Uh, what I'm now gonna do is go through basically 10 or 15 minutes on each of four areas uh, that my lab is, uh, has been engaged in. So social ecology of behavioral types. And what we're uh, acknowledging here is that often for social organisms, it's the interplay of the behavioral types that influences social dynamics and fitness outcomes, where the mix of behavioral types in a group and the overall social environment can have a big effect on how does the group work and how does the how do the individuals fare. And that the particular uh, performance metric we're going to be looking at here is mating success and patterns of sexual selection, individual differences in their mating success. So, and that being a sort of major topic of interest in behavioral ecology. So if we ask what determines mating success, then sort of ever since Darwin, we've had loads of studies suggesting that bigger, stronger males end up with higher mating success. Also loads of work uh, showing that on average, males with spectacular ornaments uh, is the term often used, flashy stuff of various sorts, tend to have higher mating success. And yet other studies showing that males that have uh, beautiful songs uh, tend to have higher mating success. But one thing that we've actually found out of that is that the amount of variance in mating success explained by these factors that have gotten a lot of attention tends to be pretty low, like 5% of the variance in mating success. So there are other things that are going on. And the recent emphasis in my lab and others is maybe personality and behavior matter. So here I've got the kind of ridiculous thing of I just have a picture of my son and we are at, uh, we're actually at Yankee Stadium together. And this is sort of, sort of embarrassing for him, but luckily he's not here listening. But I end up noting that, uh, that actually over his lifetime, girls kind of like him. 
and uh, and it's not because he is wealthy or he is big and strong. I don't notice particular ornaments, uh, but he is a particularly nice guy. And he just has a really nice personality and people in general seem to like him. And I think we know for humans that personality affects social success and including mating success or mating patterns. And so we're just asking, is that not true in other animals? And how does it work in other animals? And the animal we've chosen to study is actually a bug. It's these water striders, Aquarius remigius, uh, shown in this picture here. And a cool thing about them is they mate a lot. So they basically have new mating partners um, every day or even several times in each day. And so in a relatively you know, handleable mating season, you get in a tremendous amount of data on mating. And some individuals end up mating like 20 times in a few weeks, others not at all. Uh, and the, the way the mating works is males are very active skating over the surface of waters, in, in this case in small streams like the picture you see or the artificial streams here. Uh, and they just spend much of the day just skating around trying to mate with things they run into. Uh, when they see a female, there's no courtship. They just jump on the female, try to mate with her. And she typically resists very heavily. Uh, she doesn't need to mate yet again because females can store sperm for a few weeks at a time. Typically resist very heavily. They end up with a wrestling match. And we basically think of it as sexual coercion for a male to actually end up overcoming the resistance and mating. And with all that harassment, single females spend much of their time hiding in fact, they have sort of personalities, they have individual differences in, in behavior, but they're only expressed when there are no males around. When males are around, females are just harassed to where they just hide. But if they end up mating with a male, a male overcomes her resistance, then they mate for the next two or even up to like 10 hours or longer, carrying the male on her back. And the good thing about that is that the female then is not harassed as much and she can actually just feed and do stuff. And they end up spending roughly half of their time uh, as adults during the mating season in the physical act of mating. So the main point, I guess, is that they do a lot of mating and we get a lot of data. And so what we've done is a series of experiments over the last actually 30 years now, where we manipulate all sorts of stuff about groups that we have put together. And number two there is we manipulate lots of factors like group size, sex ratio, predation risk, food levels. And more recently, we've uh, manipulated the group's mix of behavioral types in a given pool. And for each experiment, we tend to observe uh, the animal somewhere on the range of 50 to 100 times per individual. And each observation quantify its behavior, its activity level, its aggressiveness, its feeding. Uh, and importantly, it's mating success. Is it mating? Who is it mating with? And so on the bottom there, I, I show a whole bunch of just sort of the relatively recent papers on this. And what I'm going to do today is just summarize some of the main stuff that we've come up with of interest. And the we includes um, some of these people uh, in the, uh, shown out at our artificial streams where we can control the experimental groups more easily. So if we ask, do male water striders have a personality type like my, like my son? Uh, and in fact, they do. So uh, I actually have that band on the bottom there that covers stuff at the bottom. Do you guys have that band? I don't know if anyone can uh, speak up and tell me. Um, we do not. We see yes, behavioral repeatability, R equals 0.44. OK, I actually don't know how to get rid of that band. but. Hopefully in most cases, I know what's there because it's covered up for me. But yes, water striders do show uh, repeatability. And this is just one of the studies found that repeatability score. And that's the kind of repeatability people find in other studies of personality. In fact, it's the repeatability level of your behavior. Uh, so individuals do differ in their activity and aggressiveness. And those differences do affect their mating success. So this is just one of many data sets in which, and I'll be generally showing you these coefficients, effect sizes from mixed models. But in this case says their activity aggressiveness level is affecting their mating activity quite strongly and positively. 
above and beyond all sorts of other stuff that affects their mating activity. And it's basically the more active aggressive males mate more, basically because they are more active, in particular in the places where most of the mating is occurring. So that's straightforward. Uh, does their behavior and mating success also depend on the social environment? And yes, of course it does. And in particular, in this system, it depends on the presence of what we've called hyper-aggressive males. So I'll use HAM as the uh, acronym there. And uh, the hyper-aggressive water strider males are males that are so geared up to try to mate that they jump on everything and try to mate with it. So they jump on females and struggle with them and try to mate with them, but they jump on males and try to mate with them. And that often results in sort of endless wrestling matches because males don't want to mate with that guy, but they jump on large juveniles, they jump on other species, and they've even been seen apparently mounting and attempting to mate with the dead crickets that are floating on the surface of the water that would be food for them. So they are out of control. And this incidentally is what comes up if you put in a Google hyperaggressive male is you get these pictures. Uh, so these guys are, they only keep it up typically for a day or two at a time. Some of males do it much more than others, but any given animal might be with a hyperaggressive male in the pool roughly 10% of the time. So when one of those guys is in with you, it messes up everybody else's activity. So this is just the activity in three different particular treatments of one of the experiments, but we see this over and over, that with no hyperaggressive male present, that's the blue bar, they're much more active than when a hyperaggressive male is present. And this is social plasticity. This is, you know, when one of these guys is around, it, you know, it harasses the hell out of you and your activity is much lower. And that also drastically decreases the amount of mating success in those pools. Those hyperaggressive males technically have group selection against them. They are messing up the life for everybody else uh, in that pool. So that is social plasticity, a social effect. But we're also interested in sort of more nuanced social plasticity that we also see like males, their general activity is also responsive to how many females are in the pool with them at this time. When there are more females present, males in general get more active. And that makes sense because it's, it's the mating season. They're looking for females. On average, males also get more active when there are more males in the pool. And that seems to be they rise to the sort of competition, get more active when there are more competitors around. But more interestingly, uh, they also exhibit uh, consistent individual differences in their social plasticity. And that in particular is males are consistent and different in how responsive they are to the number of male competitors in the pool. Some of them strongly increase their activity when there are more males around. Others do not respond as much and others even get less active when there are more males around. So on average, they get more active, but they consistently differ in their degree of social plasticity but they don't, as far as number of females, they all tend to get more active when there are more females around. And most interestingly, the males that have greater social plasticity had quantifiably higher mating success. So this is again, that effect size in the mixed model. And so this is evidence of adaptive social plasticity, that males that are more plastic actually are doing it in a smartly in a way that they end up with higher mating success. So just to put it out there, these are bugs. They are not what we would typically think of as highly nuanced animals perhaps, but they do exhibit a personality, they exhibit social plasticity and even adaptive social plasticity. And I would take that as a hint that that probably is important and quantifiable if we look for it in lots of other animals. Now back to the hyperaggressive males, they mess up life for others but do they at least get high mating success out of being so geared up to try to mate? And the answer in a whole bunch of experiments is no. These hyperaggressive males are so geared up to try to mate that they actually end up with low mating success because they waste a tremendous amount of time trying to mate with things that are not females. And what's more, they tend to drive everybody else out of the pool they're in and they end up with low mating success though we have found some circumstances where they do well, but in general, they don't do well. 
And that phenomenon uh, gave us the uh, uh, thought to have a new buzz term, at least for behavioral ecology, of the importance of social skill. And so what we're saying is hyperaggressive males have low social skill. They're trying to mate with males, with females, with dead crickets. They do not have high social skill since they don't seem to even distinguish those. But other male water striders have higher social skill. I showed you even basically the basic idea of the data that there's adaptive social plasticity. We also uh, have data showing adaptive social situation choice where some males actually are quote unquote smarter than others at quickly realizing the sex ratio and social situation in this pool is not good. I'm gonna leave and go to another pool. Whereas other individuals tend to not pay much attention to the sex ratio in the pool, stick around, even though there's a lot more males than females, stay there. And the males with higher plus just tendency to be doing social situation choice actually end up also having higher mating success. So social skill, we believe, matters quantifiably in water striders. And we suggest it might be also true and interesting to study in other animals. And so we've actually got a recent paper on, on that basic phenomenon. So that's going to be what I'm going to say about this aspect is uh, social dynamics of personality and sexual selection. Going to move to part two, which also has, uh, I think I'll just skip this slide that just says there's interesting social dynamics going on. I, I forgot that I had added that in, but the next issue about social ecology of mixes of personalities and how it could be important is with disease transmission. And so this is obviously like a major topic for all of us right now for COVID. Uh, that social interactions, social dynamics are influencing disease transmission. And I think it's probably highly likely that behavioral types, personalities, and mixes of personalities in humans influences the social dynamics uh, uh, and social effects that influence disease spread. And it turns out that we have been studying this basic uh, issue for quite a while in other organisms. So our basic uh, Flowchart is parasite loads, parasite transmission dynamics depend on social networks. And those depend on the movements and space use of individuals that depend on their personalities, uh, but also depend on the mix of behavioral types and movements and space use of your neighbors. And that's our overall framework uh, for, I think it, this would be interesting to study in, uh, for COVID. And uh, actually a huge, huge natural experiment going on right now for all this in COVID. But we've decided to study this in the sleepy lizard shown here. And it's a pretty big lizard. It's a, almost a kilogram. Uh, and uh, they, they're super cool. And they're in Australia, pretty abundant there. And they have ticks. So uh, the we has started out when Michael Bull uh, invited me to join his team studying this. Stefan Liu was one of the early uh, people we collaborated with and still collaborating some. And that's actually my wife, Kate, uh, also out there helping us with the field work. And the key is these lizards are big enough to carry GPS units uh, and uh, with you know, even other equipment on there. We can catch them easily. We can assay their behavioral type in controlled assays. And the key is in an area of about one and a half kilometers square, there are roughly 60 or 70 of the adults and we can capture all of them so that we can get the full social network uh, by actually tracking all the animals in the entire area all the time during the entire active season year after year. And we also quantify their ticks. And the we in recent years has also included Or Spiegel, who I think is a major figure in personality and movement ecology, and uh, David Sin and Eric Payne. And so here's the kind of stuff that we've got is uh, to begin with, these lizards also have personalities. And this, this is boldness and aggressiveness. So this is the repeatability they exhibit is the typical repeatability levels for both of them. And what we've got is the interesting thing of even uh, consistent personality uh, coming up across multiple years 
Uh, and that's relatively unusual to actually quantify that for field animals over even as many as seven years, that their uh, behavioral types are reasonably consistent. They are also consistent even across multiple years in their space use, in the size of their home range, the size of their core home range, in their home range fidelity, which is some of the individuals consistently move from year to year to be different places, and others are consistently in pretty much the same place from year to year. Uh, we've also got a bunch of data on their movement syndromes on very detailed things that movement ecologists look at about their space use. And again, they show consistency in that. And here, interestingly, they show statistical consistency uh, in their tick loads, again, over multiple years. So this would be like asking, do some of you have colds more often and others less often? And do we have data on that for year after year? Uh, so we've got that for ticks. And the answer is yes, there is statistical consistency across long periods in their tick loads. So how might that all relate? So we're thinking tick load relates to social networks that relates to movements that relate to personality. So here, here the data on it is we do have, and this is just one of many slides that I could have put up from multiple years of looking at it. And this is one of our smallest data sets on it, but I haven't had the figure is, Yes, social connectivity, tendency to be near other lizards is related to their parasite load, their tick load. And the social connectivity reflects shared refuge use, that is sort of the bushes they hide under overnight or when it's really hot, which also reflects their general shared space use. For the shared space use, uh, we're doing the movement ecology where we basically have um, huge amounts of GPS data where we track every individual in the entire field site and every step they take, uh, again, for months, year after year. And this is, this is actually a picture of the field site where all these little white spot squares and black squares are the fact that we've mapped out the food and refuge uh, throughout the field site. And these three are just three of the animals that actually have relatively large home ranges. So out of all that, comes the task of doing gigantic Bayesian statistical analyses on a huge amount of data. And Orr's uh, et al.'s paper uh, on the first batch of years of data shows this. So this is just the summary of factors that matter in terms of where do they tend to spend their time? Where do they, where do they go? And in the early season, when it's still cool and wet out there, uh, they, of course, are near, you know, the proximity to the home range center explains that's why they're there more, even by definition of the home range center. They don't seem to pay attention to where there's more food or better shrub cover or refuge from heat because there's food everywhere and it's not hot. But they do strongly, and that's what the negative negative is meant to uh, be, I guess I can use my cursor here, is they do tend to avoid other lizards. But later in the season, when it's dry and hot, of course, they still tend to be near their own home range center, but now they spent, they definitely tend to be where there's more food. They pay attention to shrub cover and in particular good refuge from the heat. And they still avoid other lizards, but less so. So out of that, we do have the data on if they have shared habitat preferences, that will tend to increase their connectivity. But if they avoid conspecifics, that tends to de decrease their connectivity, their social connectivity. Key then is all of that depends on their personality. Uh, and so what we get out of this gigantic analysis is the general thing that less aggressive lizards tended to be more responsive in the sense of being more attractive to places with food than the more aggressive lizards, more attractive to places with good refuge than the more aggressive lizards that tended to be more like they're just kind of cruising around. And so those ought to have more shared space use with other less aggressive lizards in particular uh, in the sites with more food and better refuge. But we also see that bold lizards have larger home ranges and in general have greater spatial overlap with other lizards. So we end up predicting from all this that more bold and unaggressive lizards would tend to have more ticks. And the analysis of the newer and even more data suggests that is the case Though there's, a, I'm gonna actually put it up there. There's lots more analyses yet to do on that. So what we've got here is just uh, three panels for the animals that are low, medium, and high in, in boldness. 
and their aggressiveness and tick load. And the thing that you should see here is it's the bold, high bold, less aggressive individuals uh, that tended to have the most ticks uh, connecting to uh, the various other things that we've seen. And I think, uh, yeah, so we've got lots more analyses yet to do and even incorporating in the role of various other uh, human related factors in the system. Uh, we did do a cool experiment one year where we added food in specific locations to see how different behavioral types respond to food patches that we put out and how that influences social network and maybe could even influence the uh, parasite transmission. And I think most cool is we've just finishing up an experiment where we put out distinct genetic lines of ticks that we could then track uh, as they spread onto other lizards to see if some lizards with their particular behavioral types or social network positions, in fact, are transmitting ticks uh, more to more other lizards than others. So that'd be like if we decided to pick 20 of you and give you a disease to see which of you spreads disease better uh, as a function of your behavioral type and sort of social ability. But we've done it with the lizards, but we're still analyzing those data. So that's it for sort of part two uh, of things about uh, personality. I'm going to now race on to part three. And uh, normally I would even stop and ask if there are questions on part one and two, but I think I'm just gonna blaze along here. So part three is one part of a, probably the biggest part of my overall research program these days is trying to understand variation in behavioral responses to novel situations associated with human-induced rapid environmental change, which we've used the, uh, the acronym HIREC. And so one type of the novel situations is novel predators, novel things that are safe, but might be appear dangerous like humans that are not actually dangerous, novel foods that could be good or bad, novel habitats. The key being that there's variation in these responses out there that's been quantified that, for example, for novel predators, some animals seem to get it right away and actually avoid something they've never seen before as dangerous, but others don't respond well to novel predators and get slaughtered. But what it explains the variation in that response? That's been our interest. And we've done quite a few experiments on these issues, uh, but the uh, aspect I'm going to tell you about today is theory that we've been doing on it. Big, you know, big equations, the magic of theory. But I'm not going to show you these equations. I'm going to basically tell you some predictions in words as almost just the tip of the iceberg on uh, a set of work that we've been doing. And when I say we, it's an entire, what I literally in the grant proposal called a dream team. Uh, of modelers from around the world. Uh, and I'll probably leave it as, these are some very smart people that I've managed to convince to collaborate with me on uh, modeling aspects of understanding behavioral response to, to uh, what we call HIREC. So here's the issue we're gonna talk about uh, for this part of this seminar is, imagine that you are, uh, I guess you're supposed to imagine that it's after the apocalypse and you're hungry and you're wandering around and a novel organism appears and you have to decide what to do. And in fact, you better decide quickly because you might wanna eat it, but then you better attack it quickly or you might wanna run away from it because in fact, it'll kill you. And we picture that that's what real animals out in nature are experiencing as novel things come into their world. So imagine you're wandering around and suddenly this appears and it's about 70 pounds. So normally if I give this seminar, I would ask you to raise your hand uh, if you would try to eat it and see typically that if some people would try to attack it and eat it. And I'd ask you how many would try to run away from it and others would say, yeah, I don't know what that is. So I'm gonna run away. Uh, but our basic suggestion is whatever it is, you better do it quickly uh, because this is the kind of thing that could be really important uh, for real animals in the real world. 
and that it's your personality that's going to partially uh, affect what you do. But what we've been doing is modeling why organisms might do one thing or the other using signal detection theory. And it's a well-established set of models, mo a modeling approach uh, that we added state dependence to, where you basically simplify the world into things are happening and you see something, but it's a, either a good or a bad option. So it's either safe or it's dangerous. It's either food to eat or it's poisonous stuff that you shouldn't eat. And the problem for uh, all of us is often we don't know for sure what's what and we use cues that might be imperfect to try to decide, is this safe or is this dangerous? And our response depends on sort of an evolved response threshold or perhaps a learned one where if you're thinking about, is it something safe or dangerous? Uh, and it's basically, should I run away or not? If you have a low threshold, then you flee more readily. And that kind of means you're cautious, you're fearful. And if you've got a high threshold, then it takes a really dangerous cue uh, for you to run away, then you're more bold. Uh, on the other hand, if it's talking about food, then if you got a low threshold, we're saying you feed more readily, you're voracious, and a high response threshold is you're really picky, it's got to really look good before you would actually try to eat it. And that signal detection theory has cost benefit aspects and informational aspects to figure out who should have what kind of threshold. And we use that to predict things about uh, responses to novel organisms. And the basic premise is this simple thing that if you're too bold, then you will not avoid situations that you should avoid, like dangerous predators that, uh, that you should have avoided. On the other hand, if you're too cautious, you would over avoid situations that can be safely ignored, but you were too cautious and you wasted a ton of time. But why should you be too bold or too shy is a combination in the models and in our logic basically of the personality that you have, bold versus shy, that was a, a sort of a previously adaptive and we're calling them now Q response systems that were shaped by past trade-offs and selection pressures on being more bold or more shy, but combined now with misinterpretation of novel cues, it, which is a core part of signal detection modeling. And, I do give a seminar that's a full length seminar on all these models that we've been doing where I just sort of describe how this modeling works in more detail. But here I'm gonna just jump to, here are some of the uh, logic predictions, logical predictions is why would you respond poorly and possibly get slaughtered by exotic predators? Could be because your past selection shaped you to be bold and thus, you know, not so responsive to things that come in that you're not sure what it is. And that would be, uh, you know, almost obviously enough if in the past, your familiar predators were not that abundant and or not too dangerous anyway. So, you know, not too dangerous a world, you're bold. Or the cost of over avoiding was high, like you had scarce food, so you needed to be bold. But the other half of it is, you would tend to respond poorly if you misinterpret the novel situation where the simple, simple obvious point is if exotic predators look or smell very different from familiar predators, you misinterpret them and don't respond to them and get, and get killed. But on the other hand, the modeling also suggests that you'd be more likely to misinterpret if in fact past predators and non-predators were very easy to tell apart because then we refer to that situation as you're sort of an expert, you're overconfident, you know what's safe, what's dangerous, that in fact, those organisms are actually gonna be uh, potentially more quote unquote stupid in a novel situation that does not match their previous world. And that is sort of a known thing in human psychology that so-called uh, experts that are overconfident about their own intelligence and abilities are actually even more susceptible to over to being uh, misinterpreting novel environmental changes. Finally, we had predictions on the role of the abundance of non-predators that might be mistaken for predators. And that's a factor that has, to our knowledge, rarely been mentioned in this world. There's more on how 
how many predators are in your world should matter. So if, in, for example, you are a little fish in a lake and we're looking at the upper left lake here where there are a bunch of big fish swimming around and in fact, they are mostly actually predators, then you probably evolved to be cautious uh, and avoid them. And then you will likely avoid novel predators if they at all resemble your familiar predators. But if on the other hand, you are in a world where actually there are lots of big active fish around that are non-predators that are herbivores like say catfish, then you can't afford to be avoiding every big fast thing that swims by. And that would in our modeling tend to make you more susceptible uh, to actually uh, being bold because you again, can't be avoiding every big fast thing that comes around. You'd be more susceptible uh, to being killed by a novel actual predator. This prediction uh, can be tested, I think, by just looking at different lakes to see for the larger fish that are swimming around, what proportion of them are actually predators and which are actually herbivores uh, to see whether or not that helps us to predict which kinds of systems would have smaller fish more susceptible to misinterpreting novel predators. But to us, this is a sensible enough prediction and is the kind of thing that models predict that had not been in the literature before and is, a, again, a testable hypothesis. We have also looked at this flip side of uh, the, 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 the possibility that naive prey overhide from things that are safe but might scare them that, uh, that appear dangerous to them. And we actually couched it in terms of some animals overhiding from humans like ecotourists and then if you do that, you could waste a lot of time hiding unnecessarily from humans that are not going to actually be dangerous to you. And what I'm going to emphasize here is just the fact that there were some interesting uh, predictions on the implications of that. So if you avoid safe options that appear dangerous, then you waste a lot of time uh, and that reduces your energy reserves. And we modeled out where the x-axis on these graphs is the prevalence of these novel safe things that could appear dangerous like ecotourists. And as they get more common, you waste so much time avoiding them that your energy reserves are down. And so you reproduce less and you might end up not reproducing at all because you're hiding from humans too much, even though you don't need to. But what we found that was interesting is survival also dropped quite a lot in the model, even though uh, the safe but appear dangerous things never kill them. They're safe. And these animals are following a state dependent model where they almost never starve to death and they are never killed by their safe but appear dangerous things. And yet their survival drops off quite a lot when there are a lot of these, let's call them ecotourists. And uh, when I give a full seminar with you know, uh, an interactive audience, I ask, why would, they do, why would that happen? And uh, maybe some of you can imagine it, but what happens in this model is because they're avoiding things that are safe, but you know, they just appear dangerous, they have reduced energy reserves, and they actually have to get bolder to go out there and get food, and then they get killed by their real predators. And so this, uh, prediction that we came up with is in fact a topic that has been coming up where the possibility that ecotourists make animals so unwary that they're getting killed more by their real predators. And what our models do is, is predict the situations when that would be a bigger or not so big a problem. Uh, we also have done this same basic framework for which animals would be not picky and would be susceptible to eating cane toads or microplastics, and which animals would be too picky and would not eat good foods that they could eat. But I see that I'm, I'm behind schedule, so I'm not gonna sort of talk through all this, uh, but basically tell you that this is, those are also issues that we've been talking about is how signal detection models make uh, a series of predictions on other good or bad choices in the modern world. And we've been modeling all sorts of other stuff. So everything I've been talking about is sort of the top part of this graph. But we've been also been modeling a lot of life history responses, learning, social learning, transgenerational plasticity. When would we expect them to have what kind of effect on 
uh, ability to respond to environmental changes of various sorts, uh, including multiple stressors. I'm gonna actually do one more part, even though I think I'm running out of time. I do a part four, uh, which is where personality relates to invasions uh, that could be into new habitats, uh, but it could be just moving in with humans. Uh, and these are just, you know, some of the animals that have been uh, noted as interesting invasive species. And so here, there is a, uh, a general framework in the invasion literature uh, that invasive uh, pests are ones that uh, spread very easily. They might get there initially because we put them there, but they're really going to be pests if they spread. Uh, they are also going to be pests if they can establish well uh, in new places that, that is do well at low density and grow to high density and even be ecologically important and have big impacts at high density. And those are invasive pests. And there is some literature suggesting that for personality, more aggressive, bold, active individuals might tend to be doing well in, uh, as, as far as community impact goes. And I cite actually some of my own labs papers on that for that. But the other part of that that's interesting is the dispersal and spread part. Uh, is that possibly personality dependent has been a hot topic over the last decade or so. Do, is there a connection between who tends to disperse and then what kind of effects do they have when they get to the new places? And uh, this, uh, I give credit to Lauren Pinter for first bringing into the lab with her crayfish. Uh, uh, and, and this general sort of idea that if you had a source pool with bold and shy individuals, uh, BNS for bold and shy, that you might not be surprised that it's the bold individuals that tend to disperse. They're bold, they're not scared of just sort of going out into the unknown and ending up getting to new places. It doesn't have to be that way, but it could be. And if they get into areas without major predation risk on bold individuals, and they're also active and aggressive, that might be why they are pests. Uh, they are the particular ones that are pesty, that disperse into new places. But if they go into areas where there are novel predators they don't do well with, uh, they might have trouble. They might need that enemy release to succeed. But on the other hand, if it's the shy individuals that are actually driven out and forced to disperse, they might establish okay in a new place, but not be as likely to be pests. So this basic framework, uh, we first put out actually about 15 years ago, and uh, it actually got into a New York Times article uh, where the a reader uh, wrote to me and said, you know, that that is the America story, as even exemplified by this book. Uh, um, the American mania hypothesis. And so this is the idea, as stated by Peter Weibrow, that America has a psyche, a sort of a personality uh, that he viewed as being Americans are rebellious. They don't want anyone to tell them what to do. They want to just get out there and do stuff. They want to storm into the Capitol. They want to, you know, they just, they're greedy. They want stuff. Uh, they want more wealth. They uh, actually have a big ecological footprint because they just want to do stuff. They drive SUVs. Uh, they eat too much. They get obese. And that's America. Okay. And you may or may not agree that that is America, but that's, that's one view of America. And if you ask, why is America like that? The view is it's because it's those type people who came from the rest of the world uh, the ones who didn't want anyone to tell them what to do, who came seeking their fortune, and that if you build a country out of wave after wave of those type people, you shouldn't be surprised that that's the American psyche. Okay, and so that's basically our hypothesis, uh, but we've been studying it with other animals with experiments. Uh, I actually bring this book up because this is a much more nuanced book than the P Peter Weibrow book, noting that America is actually 11 different cultures but still suggesting that each one is set by the historical roots of the type of people that came there and why did they come there, uh, uh, show, uh, influencing the different sort of uh, even regional personalities. 
but we've been studying this with various other animals. And the whole field has actually been studying this uh, in the last decade with various types of animals. And I think our, our main study system for this has been mosquito fish that are in fact referred to as one of the top 100 invasive pests in the world. And that our sort of leader in studying this was an ex postdoc Julian Cote, who was a faculty member at University of Toulouse and early on Sean Fogarty. And so what we found quite early on is their dispersal tendency uh, depends on, uh, at, at least to some degree on how social and asocial they are. So most mosquito fish are social, it is a schooling fish. But some of them, when you put them in and give them the opportunity to go hang out with their buddies or actually avoid the school, some of them are more asocial and others are everything in between. And what we find is the sensible enough thing that dispersal and performance are a combination of their behavioral type dependent and context dependent, in particular density dependent. Uh, though we've also found that it's predation risk dependent. So what we find is that at high density, social individuals actually do better than asocials in both feeding performance and anti-predator performance. And asocials don't do well at high density, they don't seem to like it, and they disperse. Uh, sensibly enough. But at low density, we find that asocials actually perform better in foraging and anti-predator uh, trials. The, it's the socials that don't like it at being in low density and they disperse. And this, there's a whole bunch of papers on this over the years. And when we put this into a model, uh, we find the following as a conceivable dynamic that if you start with a population that has, this is a cartoon of the model, uh, start with a population that has asocial and social individuals, you know, A and S, that it's the asocials that don't like this big group, they leave and they colonize the new habitat. And in fact, social individuals wouldn't even colonize these new habitats because there's nobody else around they don't like low density. But the very uh, settling of the asocial individuals sort of facilitates socials then joining them. And then density gets too high and the asocials leave, colonize new habitat and facilitate socials coming in and so on. So at least in the model, asocials facilitate the invasion of the socials, but socials keep the asocials moving on. And it's this mix of behavioral types that has the most sort of biggest, most successful invasion. And after we did that model, uh, it occurred to us that that's also generally viewed as the America story, uh, that uh, asocial pioneers that didn't like to be with lots of people moved ahead of the crowd, settled into areas that allowed more social, maybe sort of more normal individuals to follow them. Then it got too crowded and the asocial pioneers moved on and so on, uh, continuing all the way across the US up into currently the, I think, asocial uh, pioneers, stay away from me types uh, have probably ended up up there in Alaska. Okay, and we've actually even talked to historians some on whether or not we should use our models to work with them on uh, sort of understanding America. But the last part I'll tell you about this is, do the dispersers actually have different impacts on a community that they get into than the residents who don't disperse? So here we did a dispersal assay in our artificial stream, put a bunch of fish in, in the first pool, and then come back a few days later, some stayed up there, but others by a few days later had dispersed all the way down to the bottom pool, which you know others were in the middle there, didn't have to go all the way down to the bottom. But we then take those individuals that have self-sorted for us and put them in mesocosms for a month and look at what effects they have on mesocosm communities. And we've done a few of these experiments. So I'm just showing you one that is a published data set uh, where what I'm showing in the left panels is the invertebrate density and diversity a month later, uh, where the black bar is, what do you see in the mesocosms where he added the resident non-dispersing mosquito fish versus the red bars being the ones that disperse down. And what you can see is the invaders that dispersed all the way down, drove the invertebrate density and diversity to lower levels. So they had a bigger impact on the prey community and that it seems to relate to their sociability. So on the right panel, we've got how social, asocial on average 
worthy individuals and that the pool, the pools, the replicate runs that had individuals that were more asocial tended to be the dispersing pools and they ended up also driving invertebrate density lower. And we've since done other experiments where we've even gotten into more detail on what about the social dynamics of, of these groups. So to finish up the overall seminar, uh, I'll just say that the current work on mosquito fish uh, gets into the social dynamics of the mosquito fish in more detail. And it's uh, work for the PhD, uh, a couple of just finishing up PhDs by Amelia Munson and Leah Polak shown in the red box, looking at how the social mix of behavioral types affects how they respond to novel foods and novel predators. And for that matter, looking at how early exposures to different environments, including multiple stressors, affects their later behavioral type and physiology and life history, and for that matter, even gene expression patterns on the radar. And I, I guess I do finish up by noting that this connection between personality and dispersal should be important for anything about spatial ecology, not just these invasion dynamics, but anything about reintroductions, use of reserves, use of corridors, metapopulation dynamics, gene flow, and so on. And I think is largely understudied, uh, but has potential to be interesting and important. So for my final slide, I'm just going to pay homage to my two early uh, main collaborators with pictures of them from roughly 15 years ago, that being Chad Johnson and Allison Bell uh, with their dogs from 15 years ago. Uh, and then I have this picture of me with my fish. Uh, so uh, I guess that's it for my seminar. Uh, and Actually, what should I do? Should I just uh, leave this up and then, you know, that was kind of a barrage of stuff, I guess, but I'm happy to take questions either via chat or people just unmute and speak up. Or I don't know if your tradition is that Chris or, or Jeremy read out chat or whatever you do, I'm happy to talk about any of these four stories crammed into one seminar. So what's next? Yeah, we have a couple questions. Yes, I. OK, yeah. Yeah, thank you very much. You know, I, I can't ask also for the feedback. Like, is that too much to, like, to be honest, that because I've been doing this for the last 15, 20 years, and my lab is so big, this is still like I chose four of the things going on in the lab. But maybe four is too many. Is that like just too much to put in one seminar? And I should have only taken two or three and developed each of those even more. Or any feedback on that is also welcome. Like it's just. Uh... But anyway, what questions do you have? Andy, just never leave out the water striders. That's all I ask. Oh yeah. Okay. Right. No, they're they're cool. And yeah, and they mate so That's much. That's my bias. Let's see, uh, maybe the first question from Cheyenne. She asks, from the water strider experiments, does the number of hams in a pool increase once one is present? Or do they start to fade from a population once decreased fitness is realized, if it is realized? Uh, that's right. So the more detailed thing is, uh, I think I did note that the, the hams, hyperaggressive males, only keep it up for a day or two at a time, typically, because it's probably exhausting. I mean, it's literally cool to watch them. They're on the water there, and once they get into a pool, they madly dash over. As soon as anything moves in the pool, they dash over there and beat the hell out of it. And, uh, you know, it's kind of tiring to do that. And after a while, they've driven everybody else out of the pool. And then eventually, after a couple of days of that, they seem to calm down. But some of them flare up and do it again, you know, another few days later. Uh, but animals can move from pool to pool in these streams. So what they're doing has also this element of animals leaving, animals coming back, hams exhaust everybody, then they leave, you know, and so on. So it's it's a it's not as simple as they're there and everything collapses and the group literally dies out from no mating. It's a, it's a much more cool dynamic sort of situation. Cool. 
Thanks, and uh, we had another question uh, from Tal. Uh, so in signal detection theory, it sounds like personality, which is relatively fixed, dictates optimal behavior. But what about something variable like energy reserve state? That is, if you're hungry, you yeah. take greater risk. No, that's a, that's a good question. So I, uh, again, it's actually one of these things where I have a second seminar that I also give sometimes that is on this theory stuff uh, relative to HIREC. Uh, but it's all theory. And the signal detection part would get more detail, but it turns out we may be the first to do, like signal detection theory is in lots of fields and has books and you know loads of stuff, uh, but we added state dependence onto the signal detection theory so that our models actually have, if you want you know, their threshold, which you could say is how bold or cautious are they, varies depending on the state and with the feedback and it's all in the model on what do they do and how does it work for them. Uh, so yes, their behavior is definitely plastic uh, relative to their state and how the feedbacks work is part of what is their personality also. We have another question from Ellen. She asks, when and why do behavior types diverge within a population? And have you been able to determine whether behavioral syndromes are consistent for individuals across different life stages or generations? Yeah, yeah, those, those are cool questions that I think the field in general has been interested in and why individuals even diverge and stay different uh, is uh, for some, it's really just saying they have different hormone profiles. And so some are just the high testosterone versus low testosterone type, but others have been dissatisfied that with that by asking, well, then why do some have high versus low testosterone? And a paper that I actually was on with several co-authors uh, did develop the possibility that feedbacks between state and behavior maintain different behavioral types and the truth is it would take a little bit too long to weave out what we mean by that, but that's a 2015 uh, tree paper uh, that has all sorts of different things that you could call state variable that is an attempt to explain why different individuals have different personalities that even stay relatively consistent. And whether or not, not only the behavioral type, but even the correlation would stick uh, over ontogeny and with experiences has also gotten a fair bit of attention. And I'd, I'd say we don't have as clear a picture on why individuals would even be bold and aggressive and stick with it over time, but it's a topic of interest. And I think, uh, again, it, a little too complicated to sort of weave out, but I can tell you that if you're interested in it and want to email, I can probably think of what are the best papers to read, but it's these are the for people who are more sort of why do they do that in the proximate sense oriented. Uh, this has been a major topic of study over the last decade or more. And my, what I've shown you here is more what are the implications for, you know, sexual selection, disease, invasions, you know, response to environmental change and all. Because I guess I'm more of an ecologist studying behavior. We had uh, another question uh, from Matt Betts. Um, so less than 50 years ago, E.O. Wilson had ice water dumped on him for even suggesting that there are links between animal behavior and our particular animals or humans. Uh, what sort of responses do you get when uh -huh. you suggest, as you did today, that some of your findings on boldness and dispersal might apply to our species? Yeah, that's right. I think uh, in the medium distant past, uh, when sociobiology first came up, uh, and uh, tried to link uh, human behavior to other animals' behaviors from the same sort of evolutionary kin selection, et cetera, framework. Uh, there was uh, you know, a big negative response from some people uh, sort of worried about applying evolutionary theory even more generally to humans and sort of social Darwinism and eugenics and you know, all sorts of stuff. But I think it, now 40 years later, uh, I think there's, there's enough of a, a feeling like we are animals uh, and uh, what we do is no doubt shaped by something about our evolutionary history, uh, but uh, over-interpreting that can also be a problem. 
And so I can apologize if I'm too loose in being anthropomorphic in how I describe some things, uh, but I, I find it useful to get inspiration from what we know about ourselves and about humans for ideas that we can then test in other animals. Uh, but I don't think I often jump to say we understand other animals by just thinking about ourselves. Instead, we can get ideas inspired by just you know what we know about humans like the whole human personality literature is much bigger than the animal personality literature and had loads of things that are worth thinking about and studying. And those I think were all useful inspiration for what we might then study for animal personalities, but then we're gonna go study them and actually come up with a lot of new ideas that even have then spilled back over to the human personality study as these could be new perspectives that they hadn't thought of that the sort of behavioral ecologists are coming up with. Uh, so I think, yeah, naive evolutionary psychology uh, still gets criticized, probably should be for interpreting human behavior. But I guess I don't hesitate to use the ideas as inspiration back and forth for, you know, hopefully rigorous testing that we can do with water striders and sleepy lizards and so on. Uh, I think if we have time for maybe another question, uh, how can understanding the personalities of invasive species help predict their influence on native systems? Or do you have an example? Yeah, and so that's sort of what we're building up to for the, for the mosquito fish, uh, but we have not actually fully taken it out into the field. There are nice examples. I think Renee Duckworth's work on the bluebirds is a is one of the best examples of where it's all field-based, how the dispersers tend to be more aggressive and how that influences the competitive dynamics of Western and mountain bluebirds. And for that matter, over the years, it's morphed into even how it relates to dynamics that include fire, fire regimes and cycles and uh, maternal effects and so on. Uh, so I think it does turn out that in the invasive species literature, uh, for people that are behavior, behaviorally oriented, there are now quite a few examples where we're thinking in terms of how personality relates to it. Uh, but the number that, that would end up being that we fully understand how invasions work uh, and the role of personality is, is, not, is, you know, is not fully developed in most of those examples. Uh, but if you know that personality dependent dispersal is an important part of it, then you could think back to why does dispersal occur the way it does and get a better picture of what kinds of ways would you try to manipulate the system. Uh, I'll say in another system we've been studying with lizards, uh, with little skinks, the dispersal is associated with actually humans dispersing them. Uh, and if you know that's the case, uh, then you can ask what kind of animals do they end up dispersing? How does that affect their role in the new community? But if they get dispersed by some other vector and that has a different uh, effect on the community, then you can actually ask which kinds of vectors are you, would you be more worried about? And uh, it might be the usual thing that if you understand the system better, system by system, you know, uh, you might have different sort of uh, uh, possible management implications. Um, I don't know if I have a favorite example of when it's actually been used for managing invasive species. I should probably think about that more. Is there a best case study to, to highlight? Do any of you know a best case study to highlight on the role of personality, even personality dependent dispersal and invasion? and how it can actually be used in managing the system. You do have me wondering if our local barred owls are especially bold. Ah, right. And they are causing trouble for the spotted owl. Eh? Yeah, I mean, so that that's the kind of thing that people have often tested. That this is actually big uh, over the last decade, many, many systems, people have thought to themselves, hey, I am in a place where I know the 
sort of range expansion edge. And I can ask, are the animals that are range expanding, are the particular populations there, take them and test their personality versus where they might've come from. And with the skinks, we even do have enough genetic data, population genetic level data to say, which part of Australia did they come from in which part of New Zealand and approximately where, when did they get there? And we can actually then you know, compare their, their personalities and say something about that, but how much that actually contributes to the invasion uh, impact and how much uh, that has an actual management implication, I can't really say. We've been studying it more as ecologists that love to try to figure out what's going on than applied impl management implications. Uh, Andy, we have a, a couple more questions. Are you okay with continuing or do you wanna make the next one, the last one? How are you feeling? You know, I guess I'm willing to answer more questions and I know I'm talking to quite a few tomorrow and you know, uh, we could leave it as say one, one more question or, or two more questions. And then if anybody has actual other follow-up, you know, obviously I'm happy to email or even arrange a Zoom meeting with anybody else any other time because it's Great. the Zoom world. Yeah. Yeah, I think- so uh, like Two more questions, yeah. Sure. Well, I think, I think we can, uh, uh, Marie, Tosa and Sam have questions that I think are similar. Uh, so Marie asks, um, if you think that behavior types are inherited or learned or both. And it's kind of like a follow-up to that. Sam asks, uh, to what extent are personality traits, particularly the bold shy spectrum, evolvable? And uh, i.e., could there be some rapid evolution at the invasion front with the bold, aggressive, yeah, yeah. antisocial individuals being selected for? Yeah, that's right. So all of those sources are, and it's almost like uh, many traits that are plastic share the same thing is they do evolve, they have plasticity, and the plasticity is shaped in part by the early experiences and also often by transgenerational plasticity. Uh, but there's often even ongoing further change that like it would be the case for any of you, maybe sadly for some PTSD-like thing, that if you had an, an experience now, it could easily further shape your personality and so that's been that's a ongoing hot topic is uh, the evolution, transgenerational plasticity, early experience effects, and recent experience effects on the personality that individuals have now that then affects how they respond to, for our studies, even novel stuff having to do with uh, environmental change, like novel predators, novel you know fish that eat plastics, you know, and stuff like that. So, and what we have is we have, one of the theoretical topics we've had is, can you even predict how important uh, transgenerational plasticity ought to be uh, based on what, as opposed to just measuring that, oh yes, it happens in my system. What would be a framework for predicting how important should it be in influencing traits and then in influencing the response to environmental change? And so that's a paper that's you know in review right now with a bunch more modeling yet to come out. So maybe I'll, I'll say thank you for your for your attention, and I'm open to other ex uh, comments, including whether or not I should actually kick out one of those four sections because there's like too much in this seminar. I didn't even time it, but it seemed like it was about 55 minutes instead of 50 or something like that. But I'm, yeah. So thank you for your attention and for inviting me. Thanks so much, Andy. That was great. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, and I'll talk to a lot of you tomorrow. Yeah. Thanks, Andy. Appreciate it. I thought it was great the length it was. So that's my vote. <laughs> okay, cool. Yeah. All right. Thanks much. All right. Thanks. Okay. I guess I'm going to.